Uh, and I'm excited to deliver this message to you. We're in a series called, you know, it, it, it's the fruit of the spirit. And where this has come from is you guys were, have been asking for prayer. You know, I, you know, we'd like more faith in our life, more peace, uh, more love, more kindness. And you essentially were asking for the fruits of the spirit, maybe without even knowing that that's what you were asking for. And so we thought, okay, you can, we can give you fruit, we can help you deal with fruit, but what's more important is that underneath every fruit there is a, a root, and that it's the root system that determines those fruits. So good roots will give you bad fruit, uh, sorry, good roots will give you good fruit, bad roots will give you bad fruit. And so we have to look at the root system to our fruits. And so today I want to talk about probably one of the most dangerous roots that there is out there. It's the one that can have kind of one of the most detrimental impacts on you. And it's the, the root of bitterness. So the root of bitterness here. You know, bitterness is, is you know, it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's even like a, a state of mind or a state of being. I think it's the most dangerous thing that we can carry around or we can embody or we can feel. You may say, okay, well, Pastor Chris, what about hate? Because hate is pretty bad. You know, uh, but hate typically doesn't drive you to the same edge or end point that bitterness does. You can hate people for different things, but maybe not wish that they would evaporate from the earth and die and be gone forever. But bitterness will uh, drive you to have that desire. Bitterness creates anger. Anger can be driven back to bitterness. Hate can be connected back to bitterness. Bitterness is a root, and it is a strong and dangerous root. This root of bitterness will, will sit underneath all these other emotions that you have. You may think that you're dealing with hate or anger. You may think you're dealing with those things, but really underneath you're dealing with bitterness. Now I want to connect this word bitterness to something that's equally as, as powerful. These two are, are so connected together. The second thing I want you to understand a little bit about is division. So Division and bitterness are intimately connected. This is something that is very like near and dear to Casey and I, because we've dealt with a lot of division. Every single time that we come up against God getting ready to move, guess what we see in our life? We see division. You know, Casey and I, we met, uh, we were both missionaries that came to South Africa independently. We met in Pumalanga, we met in White River, and we ended up, you know, dating, getting married. And what we've seen across our marriage is that everywhere that there was about to be a breakthrough, everywhere that God was calling us into something, everywhere that God was about to work and about to move, we would see division. And this, this division was always there when God was about to move. And I want you to see how bitterness and division now are connected. See, bitter roots yield divisive fruit. Bitter roots yield divisive fruit. Now, this word divisive here, if you've got a, a root system with a fruit, you know, on top of the, the flower, you've got bitterness underneath the soil, bitterness that is creating the fruit. And that fruit above is division. And so everywhere that we have had division into our lives... If we've traced it back, it is always, every single time, it has gone back to a person that is bitter. Every time God was about to move in this church, in our lives before this church, it, it's like Casey and I, we know it. We can feel it. I can feel the moment that division enters the life of this church or enters our lives or our marriage. And every time it's traced back to a bitter person. And this divisiveness here, I want you to understand what this means. It's not just dividing yellow M&Ms from blue M&Ms and saying, you like yellow, that's fine, I like blue, and that's fine. No, that's not the kind of division that we're talking about here. This divisiveness, it's an adjective that means causing disagreement or hostility between people. Divisiveness is meant to tear you down. It's meant to tear down. It's meant to create hostility against each other. It's meant to make a marriage, uh, two partners in a marriage hate each other. It's meant to destroy relationships. It's meant to uh, take something that is flowing in unity like a church and instead turn it against each other. Now you have different people that, that are against each other. You have these opposing forces here, 
but it's filled with disagreement and hostility. That hostility is an important part of this. As of Thursday afternoon, me and Kyle, we, we, did our, we do a run-through here where I stand in an empty room. It always takes me back to the COVID days. For those of you that don't know, when we were up against, when we were in COVID, I had to learn how to preach. I'd never really preached before when Casey and I took over the church, so I had to learn how to preach and communicate. And I did it here in an empty room because it was COVID, and we had TVs set up around the room so that I could pretend that there were people out there. And I would, I would preach. I remember how great it was when people started coming into the building. I felt less crazy. But on Thursdays, I enter back into crazy town. And Thursday afternoons, we do a run through. And I kind of go through my sermon. And I finished the sermon on Thursday. And it was not this sermon. It kind of was, but it wasn't. Thursday afternoon, God began to unpack something, this, this thing in me, as I thought about the message. And, and then Thursday night... We had a break-in here at the church, and some three guys came in, and they stole 15 laptops you know, that were here in the auditorium. We knew exactly where, where to go and what to do. You know, it's like I could, I could feel that, that, yeah, we're on the cusp of something, and now all these you know, outside forces come in, and they have this impact. They want to steal our security or steal the safety or you know, or, or things like that. But I, this word, division, came to mind. And it just kept coming to mind. So I started, okay, God, let me unpack this, or will you unpack this? That's preacher talk for tell me more, please, because I don't understand. Right? And so God began to speak to me about divisiveness. And in my head, Thursday night, and on Friday, and on Saturday, I rewrote this message. And so I'm very excited to communicate this to you, because I feel like that it is exactly what a lot of us are dealing with. When it comes to bitterness. So because bitterness creates this divisive spirit or a divisive person, I've got three divisions for you today. Now the first division that we look at, I've got the word first highlighted here because it starts all the way to in the beginning. The first of the first. It starts with Eve. And we find it in the book of Genesis. But this is the first division that I want you to become aware of. And in this, we look at Genesis here. Let me... Um, Kind of set this up for you so that you understand. Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 1, 4 through 5. Excuse me while I scratch my head because it feels very good. Okay. <laughs> Just be honest. Verse 1 here. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. The serpent is, is Satan. It's the devil. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said... You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. See, he's in process of deceiving Eve. Comes in and, and we look at deception, divisiveness. A lot of times it starts with something that's gentle. It starts with a normal conversation. You know, has God really said that? I mean, he knows the answer. He knows that Eve knows the answer. But he starts to kind of peel the layers back and, and reveal this to her. Has God really said that it's, it's kind of like these are seeds that are sown in your life or in your situation someone says hey did you did they really say that about you did, do you think they really didn't respond to your text or to your whatsapp because they were actually busy and it's just seeds get sown and so look at what he does satan then goes in and he says the servant said to the woman you will not surely die so he's they're, they're like having a casual conversation here. And he's, he's calm. He's just talking, chatting. He says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Let me tell you what's happening here. This seems like one thing, but a lot of times what deceit does, it changes, it, it covers things up so it isn't what it seems like. So let me show you this here. So the first sin was not with Adam and Eve. The first sin, some of you are like, what? This is not a Bible-believing church. But here's the first sin. In heaven, the worship leader was Satan. And he was cast down out of heaven with a group of angels that went with him. It's in Isaiah 55. And when that happened, that happened because Satan wanted to steal the glory from God. And so you have someone that sits 
with God in heaven that is the worship leader for the angels and wants more, wants the glory of God, he is immediately cast down to earth, put on this rock that we call earth, made to crawl on his belly, made into a snake. He goes from one of the most glorious angels to a snake in the dirt. I, I think Satan was probably a little bit bitter. And that, that bitterness created this divisive spirit, this desire to just uh, divide. And that brings us to the first division. And that's that bitterness will divide you from your creator. That's exactly what Satan is doing with Eve right there. He's deceiving her. His bitterness-fueled, divisive spirit is meant to tear Eve from the creator, from her creator. See, before this moment, Adam and Eve, they were made in God's image. They walked with God through the garden. They had an intimate relationship with God. They were given the whole garden. They were given everything. But then Satan came in and he divided them because he was bitter about what happened with him, about being cast down. And then Eve eats the fruit. And she eats and she gives to Adam and Adam eats. And immediately they realized that they were naked. Immediately they felt like they needed to hide from God. And then they went from being in constant communion with the Creator to hiding from Him. So that God walks through the garden and says, where have you gone? Where are you? He finds them. And he says in the next verse in, in Genesis here, he says, And the Lord God said to the woman, What have you done? See, he knows something's wrong. Because why are you hiding from me? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Divided from God. From there, God would, would divide them from the garden. Would have to cast them out. God would bring a, a sacrifice in to cover for their sin. But that division came out of bitterness. Now, Paul picks this up in 2 Corinthians. This isn't something that stays in Genesis. This continues through the whole Bible, and it continues all the way to you today. So Paul is preaching to this church, so let's just pretend that this is, is you know, relevant today, which it is, but like, this is me communicating this to you here. So let's look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul says, But I fear lest, anytime you see lest, you could say for fear of. So Paul says, But I fear... For fear of, somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul is saying he was good enough, he was strong enough, he was deceitful enough to tear Eve from God in the garden. Is he uh, also able and capable to tear us from God in here? See, Paul is trying to highlight this very simple truth. See, God gave Eve a simple, simple truth. Eve, eat everything from this here. Don't eat this thing here. Very simple. Not complicated. Not complicated at all. But Satan took her directly to that. And the gospel message, which we have, is also very simple. God loved you. God died for you. God rose for you. The gospel, gospel means good news. The good news is, is that grace and mercy is abundant for you. Grace is you getting something you don't deserve. Mercy is that you're spared from something that you do deserve, like a punishment. And so we have a very simple message from God. And it's the gospel message is good for you. Turn to Jesus, accept the salvation. That's simple. It's not complicated. And here Paul is saying, do not be deceived. Do not be corrupted from the simplicity that is in this message for you. We have walked away from the simplicity of Christ, but it's not necessarily our fault. We are kind of at the mercy, or it's a product of bitterness. Bitterness drove Satan to deceive Eve, to divide her from God. See, Satan did not come after Eve's marriage to Adam. Satan came after her heart and that relationship with God. That was, that was what he wanted to start with. That's the first division. How close are you to God? Or better yet, how close were you to God? How close were you, but now you feel so far away? Because God hasn't walked away from you. And you've not necessarily separated from God, but you feel far from God. How, 
How, how prevalent is that in your life right now, today? If it's there, then the divisive deceiver has tried to divide you from God. And just know that that division that you feel, that separateness that you feel from God, that does not come from God at all. It's a trick. It's a trick to deceive you. Now the second division, the second great division for us here. We looked at first you being divided from your creator, being divided from God. But this one, it continues to kind of like uh, expand. It goes beyond your heart and then it, it, it goes out even further into your relationships, your life. Let me show you a verse here that kind of sets this up really well for us to look at it. It's in Hebrews 12, 15. We're going to talk a little bit out of Hebrews today. We're jumping into kind of the middle of this scripture here, the middle of this verse. And the author of Hebrews, he's giving a, a lot of warnings. So he's saying, hey, be careful about this. Be careful about that. Hey, church, watch out for these things here. And so part of that is he says, look carefully, lest, so for fear of, look carefully for fear of anyone falling short of the grace of God. See, the grace of God is this, uh, it, it's there, it's available for everybody. That's the mercy, that's the grace, that's the good news, the gospel message. And it's available for anyone. Anyone can say, I want salvation, I want God. But what it means to fall short of that is it means to not accept that or take that or ask God for that. And so the author here is saying, hey, don't let anything keep somebody from encountering the grace of God. And so it says, for fear, because without God, look what happens, a bitter root grows. For fear of any bitterness springing up and causing trouble, there are consequences to bitterness. It's, it does not come without consequence. If you're dealing with bitterness, if you've got that divisiveness in your heart, or if you've got somebody in your life that is bitter and divisive, there is a consequence to that. You feel the consequence, they feel the consequence, but bitterness is not something that you hide or that you bury or that you deal with privately in the car. It's impossible. It is like a it is it is literally like a cancer that just if your heart belongs to Jesus, then bitterness will take over your thoughts. It'll find whatever way it can to get into your heart. It'll start here, and it'll work its way down and get right into your emotions, right into your heart. Nobody is free from bitterness. It will come after anybody and everybody. It has no prejudice. And when it does, it will impact you, and it will impact those that are around you. It will cause trouble. It's a guarantee. It goes on to say, and by this, many will become defiled. So these two words here, many and, and defiled, many means, just like I said, that your bitterness that you feel or you're dealing with, or the bitterness of others that are in your life. A lot of people after the first service said, you know, immediately when we were talking about bitterness, somebody's name came to mind or their face came to mind. That bitterness there has an impact on many people. That means that it doesn't just sit isolated with one person. It spreads. And as it spreads, it defiles people. Look, look at what the word defiled means here. So defiled in, in the Greek, what it's referencing to is this truth that it, it's to die with another color. It's to stain. To die and to stain. It, it changes. I, I, two examples for you here. Um, I've got a bunch of t-shirts that I used to wear. I don't wear anymore. And I don't understand how this has happened. But every single t-shirt has like a stain right here. I don't, I, it's like a grease stain, you know. I don't, under, I don't understand it. I don't like drink olive oil or what, you know. But it's, it's all these t-shirts have been stained. And when that happens, it goes out of the like where to work pile. And it goes into the uh, never wear pile. Or it goes into the where to the gym pile. But it, it's been stained. And now that it's stained, it doesn't get worn everywhere. It's not presentable you know, in every situation. It becomes like a, like a junk t-shirt. And bitterness wants to die. It wants to stain. You know, also, th this word die made me think about my kids. It, it, who in here has got kids or grandkids? Or you, know, you regularly have, there's a few of you, you regularly have children... Uh, that are in your home. I, my kids have this great ability. Maybe you guys can relate to this. Where actually, it's a, it, we're worried about it. Maybe it's a medical condition. 
All right. The medical condition is, is that their arms just go like this when they walk down the hallway. They don't even know it. But as they're walking down a the hallway, their arms come up and their arms find the wall. They don't even know what they're doing. And then their hands turn and they just drag, you know, <laughs> just drag. And if their shirt is dirty, then they'll just lean their shirt and walk <laughs> and drag, you know. If they've got dirty feet, guess which couch they get on? The white one. They just know. See, they are dyed with dirt. And when they touch, that spreads. We can't scotch guard their hands. And so when you are dyed or stained, everything you touch also dies and stains. It spreads. You walk through your life with dirty hands, rubbing the walls. And those walls are people, they're relationships. And everything you touch gets impacted by the bitterness that you carry. And that bitterness has died and stained you. And that brings me to the second division. And it's because of bitterness. Bitterness will divide you from your friends and your family. It will divide you from others. Because everything that you touch, it doesn't just sit with you. See, the first uh, division is between you and God. That's, that's you and your Creator. But the second division is you and everybody else because it cannot stay contained. Bitterness is a root that will not stay contained. It is a poisonous root. In the Bible, there's a root called uh, wormwood, and it's a bitter root. And anywhere that it is, it poisons everything that's around it. And in fact, there's a spring called Mara, which means bitterness. And they say that maybe this spring was bitter because it was surrounded with wormwood. Bitterness will not stay just in your spirit or in your heart or in your soul. It will spread to everyone around you. And if you're having bitterness injected into your life or you're having the, the, the spirit of division that you're sensing around you or someone's trying to create hostility amongst you and your relationships, well, you've got somebody that's died and stained that's trying to rub up against your life. But you have the ability to stop that. I want to show you what happens with somebody that is consumed with bitterness. There's a guy, it's a perfect example here. Go back to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 is talking a lot about bitterness, and it raises up a, a gentleman by the name of Esau. And we talked about bitterness dying you and staining you. Esau is called Esau because when he was born, he was red. I, I don't, I'm not saying those two or you know, there's anything theological there, but I just thought it was interesting. But if we jump in here in Hebrews 12, it's setting up a little bit about Esau. And it says, and see to it that no one is immoral or godless. So again, the author of Hebrews is trying to warn people. And so he says, hey, make sure that no one is immoral or godless. Church, take care of yourselves. Make sure that everyone has their morals up, that, that they're all in relationship with God. But make sure that no one's immoral or godless like Esau, who is known for selling his own birthright for a single meal. So this, this act that he takes, what does this tell me about Esau and his bitterness? Esau is the firstborn. That means that when dad dies, he gets a double portion of everything. He's got Jacob, his little brother. But when dad passes away, a double portion of everything comes to him. That's the inheritance. That's the blessing of the firstborn. Esau goes out and he is on a hunt and he comes back and he's very hungry. And his brother Jacob is cooking a meal. And what this is referencing is, is Esau sells his double portion of the inheritance for a bowl of stew, for a bowl of beans, for lentils. Now, I don't think that those beans were that good. I think that Esau was that poisoned. I think that Esau was bitter because he knew that Jacob was the favorite. So I think Esau did not respect his inheritance because bitterness had separated him from his family. It had emotionally separated him from his family. You know, uh, Jacob is the favorite. Jacob is the one that, that mom loves the most. You know, what, what does this inheritance mean? Who cares? Who cares about me in this family? It's all about Jacob. Jacob this, Jacob that. So sure, whatever, Jacob. You're the chosen one. You give, me, give me a chosen bowl of soup. You want my inheritance? What's it matter? Here you go. Esau did not respect the inheritance, didn't respect his family because bitterness had driven him and separated him from that. 
If we jump in and look at the story in Genesis, this is Esau after his, his, he sold his birthright. It's Esau after Jacob tricked his father Isaac into getting the blessing. Look where we find Esau. He saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and that he had sent Jacob away to Paddan Aram, which is to, to take a wife for himself, and that he was blessed and that he blessed him when he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. This is important. So Esau watches his younger brother get sent away with the blessing and be instructed, you'll be blessed if you marry the right woman. It's essentially what he's saying there. And that Jacob, then Jacob obeys. He obeyed his father and his mother, and he had gone to Paddan Aram. Now, look at Esau's uh, reaction to this. And this is filled with spite. So that's another offshoot of bitterness. The root of bitterness creates a divisive spirit, and spite is just a, it's a tool of division. And Esau feels that spite. His heart is filled with it. And so out of spite, he does something that is so destructive to his relationship with his parents because he's bitter. And he's been divided from others, from those around him. So if we look here, look at what he does. Some of you could just put two and two together and figure it out. So Esau saw the daughters of Canaan did not please his dad. Oh, you don't like these ladies? You don't like them? Well, guess what I'll do. So he goes to Ishmael, and he takes one, and he marries them. And he marries them to be in addition to the wives that he had. So Esau, this is the third time that Esau has married the exact women, which means that he's connected their families to the exact people that he knew that his mom and his dad did not like. In fact, uh, if you dig into the story even further, uh, Isaac and his wife actually say, we, th this guy and his wives are giving us grief. They do not like this at all. But Esau has chosen to do it because he's bitter. And because he's bitter, he's divisive. And because he's divisive, he has allowed bitterness to divide him from his family. Now the sad part of this, there is a sad truth and reality to this. And this is what I, I hope that you don't have to experience. But I know that you are. I know some of you are dealing with this and walking through it. And if you haven't, you will. In Hebrews 12, it goes, we go back to Hebrews. And we see the sad part of Esau's life. Later in Esau's life, after he's lost the blessing, after he's married the women, after division has creeped in and done the damage, after bitterness has, has sat in his heart for years and years and years, he wanted to regain title to his inheritance the inheritance of his blessing. So he says, maybe I can get that back because I, I want to live with the blessing. I'm so far from my father, from my family. I want to live with the blessing. But he was rejected. And he was rejected because he found no opportunity for repentance. And what this is saying in the scripture is that there was no way to repair what he had done. No chance to recall the choice that he had made. Even though he sought for it with bitter tears, not tears of sorrow, but bitter tears, angry tears, hateful tears, hurtful tears. See, God can restore any relationship, but it doesn't mean that everyone chooses to let God restore the relationship. And here Esau had done damage to a point that his mom, his dad, that Isaac had said, no, 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 it's beyond repair. It's beyond repair. Something so simple as as allowing you know, bitterness to creep in in small ways has now left Esau separated from family forever, crying bitter tears because there's no room in his life with his relationship with others for there to be repentance or forgiveness. Ah, that's a sad place to be. When, when kind of God was revealing this scripture to me and I was thinking about my own life and thinking about you guys, there are so many relationships that we feel like are beyond repair. So many marriages, so many family issues, so many mom and father or, or, you know, like generational relationships where there's just brokenness and there's hurt and there's pain. And you're either on the side of, I don't want anything to do with this person. I'm going to close the door and forever keep them out. Or you're on the other side of, how, how, I, I couldn't even begin to restore the hurt or the pain or the damage that's been done. So on both sides of that coin, because of bitterness, because of division, a, a family, a relationship has been destroyed. I, I just, 
don't want you to live that way. But unfortunately, you may come to a healthy place where you say, I want to move beyond this. And you may come there, but it doesn't mean the other person will. And that's, that's sad. It's sad for all parties. See, so the first division divides you from your Creator. The second division divides you from everybody else. And this third division, this is a, this is a very strong one. It's a very uh, important one for you. Th- this division means the difference between survival and not. And I, I thought about this one. I thought about it hard. You know, I used a bunch of different words for it. You know, I used the word, you know, okay, so bitterness will divide you from life. Bitterness will divide you from, uh, you know, happiness. I even thought, okay, bitterness will divide you from life in quotation marks to try and say, okay, that's like a Jesus-filled life. And I just, none of those words worked. And then God gave me the word for this. And as soon as I, I heard it and I sensed it, I said, that's it. That's exactly what it is. The third division is that bitterness will divide you from hope. It'll divide you from hope. Because once you've lost hope, it's, you've lost everything. It's, you know, it's amazing what a person will endure and go through if there's hope. And it's amazing what a person will let go of and give into if they feel like that there is no hope. Now, I've been obsessed lately, um, you know, give you a, an example here of this. So I've been really obsessed lately. I, I go through my phases on YouTube, and my algorithm is very, very important on YouTube. So if one of my children are on YouTube, I always look, are you on my account or are you on Casey's account? Because I don't care what happens to Casey's algorithm, uh, but I care about mine. So <laughs> what that means is when I open YouTube, I know exactly the things that I'm going to see. And so you can track the seasons of life. So for a long time, if you logged into my YouTube account and you looked, you would just see video after, you know, all the suggested and recommended videos would be something about like cops. Like, you know, uh, we had a TV show in the States where cops would pull people over and, uh, you know, they had a camera crew that followed them. So I mean, yeah, well, why not inject stress into every moment of my day, you know, and, <laughs> and watch this. So... I've replaced that stress with a new stress. Now, I've got all these stories. There's some great storytellers that tell stories of cave diving accidents, right? So why not just, you know, put it on just, you know, in the background where you're just casually listening to these stories. And, and this is, has so much to do with hope. I, I listened to a, a story the other day. It was yesterday, the day before of a cave diving accident. They got separated. Some things happened. Mistakes were made. I've become a bit of an expert on how to survive in caves now (laughs) through all the videos that I watch. What ends up happening is a, is a, a cave diver, he finds an air pocket, and he can't get to the entrance to the cave, so he goes up and he's in the air pocket. He spends 60 hours there with no food, uh, with no water because the water was salty. 60 hours, but he survived because he had hope. But then there's story after story after story of people that don't make it 10, 15, 20 minutes because they lose hope. Satan would love to divide you from your hope because if he can steal your hope, he can steal your future. If he can steal that hope from you, then he can impact everything to come after that moment. Don't let Satan steal your hope. It's bitterness. That's how bitter the originator of sin is. If he can't separate you from God, if he can't separate you from others, he's going to do everything he can to take the hope from you. Let's look at, there's a character in the Bible, there's a real person, real story, real events here, a a lady named Ruth and a lady named Naomi. And Naomi was married to a very prominent man, and then in a heartbeat, she lost it all. And look at what happens through bitterness. So when two of them went away, so this is Naomi and Ruth, they'd gone away on a journey. They go into a small town called Bethlehem. And because Naomi was married to such an influential man, when they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole city was stirred because of them. And the women asked, is this Naomi? The whispers, is this her? Is this who was married to him? Is this this the one? Is this the woman? And she responds. Naomi speaks up. She responds in verse 20. And she says to them, do not call me Naomi, which means sweetness. Instead, call me Mara, which is bitter. For the Almighty, look at who's to blame here. The Almighty is to blame here. 
So the Almighty has caused me great grief and bitterness. I left full with the husband and two sons, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Who's to blame for Naomi's uh, loss of hope? Well, she says it's God. She says God stole it from her. God has afflicted her. It's God's fault. God did this to me. See, the deceiver, he came in, he deceived Eve, he deceives your relationships, and now in order to steal your hope, he'll deceive your perspective or your perception of God. And that leaves us asking questions like, isn't God sovereign? Okay, Sovereignty is this idea that, that, that God is, is good, he is all good, he's all powerful, all everything. And, and this, this sovereign God, he would not let bad things happen. Or if a bad thing has happened, if I've lost a husband or that person's died or been lost to cancer or my marriage has fallen apart or that relationship I tried to restore wasn't restored, well, you know, if God would have fixed it if he wanted to. And I'm at the mercy of God. But you have misunderstood something about the sovereignty of God. See, God's sovereignty means that He has power and authority over everything. But what God did in His sovereignty is when He made Adam and Eve, He created choice. He sewed it into the the way that existence and relationships work. God said, I create you, but I also create choice. And as soon as we were given choice, choice to choose Him so that He could be chosen by us to be loved... As soon as we were given that choice, we chose the wrong thing. It's not that God allowed the cancer to take somebody or God allowed your marriage to fall apart. God's heart breaks for that stuff to happen, but we're the ones that messed it up, not God. We were given choice and we made the wrong choices. We screwed it up. And when we introduced sin into the world, that brought with it brokenness. That brought with it uh, cancer. That brought with it sickness. That brought with it uh, relationships that refused to be restored. All that came in. And, and if God was to say, I'm never going to let bad things happen to you, or I'm, I'm allowing this bad thing to happen because I've chosen you to endure a bad thing. No, 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 no. God is saying, I gave you choice, and because I gave you choice, bad things happen. But I am still in authority. I am still all-powerful here. See, Naomi was saying that God did this to me. And God is saying, no, 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 Naomi, I love you so much. The broken world has done this to you, but I'm still here for you. And we find ourselves in this place of saying, God's holding out on me, on you. God's not doing something for me or you that he should be doing. If you take these two statements, I want you to to manipulate these statements and think to yourself, where, where is it that God is holding out on me? And where is it that God is not giving me the healing? Not, God's not giving me the forgiveness. God's not restoring the relationship that he should be healing or forgiving or restoring. These two statements here will bring you right to the doorstep of bitterness. If you feel bitter towards a person, a situation, towards God, towards yourself, I promise you can track this down. You can find this. Somewhere you feel like something's being held out on you that you deserve. Somewhere in your heart you feel like something should be done by God and He has chosen not to do it. And because of these two things, you've let bitterness grow. Now, I I, I don't want to leave you just with that. We're going to talk about the cure for bitterness. Because it can divide you from your Creator, it can divide you from others, and it can divide you from your hope. How do you cure it and fix it? Now, I actually, and I may even do this, need to do a whole message on forgiveness. We may do this next week. But a whole message about being forgiven, about forgiveness. Because forgiveness is the cure for bitterness. Let me show you in Ephesians where this is here. In Ephesians, it says, Let all bitterness, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let that be put away. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiveness is your pathway to curing bitterness. And it's between you and you and you and God. I can't guarantee that the other person will participate. But this is for you to cure your bitterness. It's for you to set up boundaries so that another person's bitterness doesn't impact you. It's forgiveness. And Jesus modeled this for us. 
There's a scripture in Psalms, Psalm 69, 20 through 21. This is what the Bible, it's called a messianic scripture, which means it's about what Jesus will do. Or it's a scripture about the coming Savior or Messiah. And Jesus fulfills every single one of them. Look what it says. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. This is, this is foretelling Christ. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for, comfort, for comforters, but I found none. This is Christ being led to the cross. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my first they gave me vinegar to drink. That's bitterness. Gall and vinegar were bitterness. Then Jesus fulfills this in Matthew 27. And look at what your Savior did for you. And then they'd come to the place called Golgotha, place of the skull, and they gave him sour wine mingled with gall, bitterness. And they gave it to him to drink, but when he tasted it, he would not drink. See, every single one of us are going to taste bitterness. Jesus on the cross is given bitterness, but he doesn't drink it. Instead, look at what he does. Look at what your Savior does for you. We go to Luke here. After Jesus is given this, the very next thing he does, Father, forgive. Forgive them. Forgiveness is your cure for bitterness. Now, this is the point in the message where I want to give you an opportunity to accept this forgiveness that Jesus talks about on the cross. If you've never accepted it, then you have an opportunity to do that today. And so when we ask that you accept salvation or you consider accepting salvation, this is what we're asking you to, con to consider, and it's this. At some point, and they're going to put it on the screen for you, at some point in all of our lives, we have to transfer our trust away from what we think that we can control and into what Jesus did, which is out of our control. It's no longer about what I can do, but what, it's about what He's done. So you're transferring your trust from you to Christ, from you to Him, from what you've done and gone through to what He's already done for you. And with that, you're able to pray a prayer of salvation. So I want to lead us in this prayer. I want everybody, you can bow your head and close your eyes. If you're a visual learner, you can open your eyes when we pray. But if you've never experienced the forgiveness of Jesus, then today is your day. And if you have experienced the forgiveness of Jesus, but you've got bitterness that's rotting your life, that's a root in your life, then when we go into worship, I want you to get, get help with that. But for those of you that need forgiveness, that need to, to know what that is, here's your prayer. So it starts with, Dear Heavenly Father, I know I am a sinner. I know my sins should separate me from you forever. I believe your son Jesus died for me. I accept his death as payment for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for giving the gift of Jesus so I could live with you in heaven. Come into my life and be my Savior and friend. In Jesus' name, amen.